perhaps that will be, you know, enable us to get out of this um, lie that the central banks have been telling us about, that a growing economy uh, uh, shouldn't have falling prices. Welcome to Wave Life. One thing before we start, we're not financial advisors. Investing carries risks of losses. Make your own decisions. I'm Greg Guyton here with my co-host and for this episode, Dave Allman. And today we have a special guest, Murray Gunn. Murray Gunn is head of global research at Elliott Wave International. He's worked as a fund manager in global bonds, currencies, and stocks, including long posts at Standard Life Investments and the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. Prior to joining EWI, he was head of technical analysis at HSBC Bank. Murray is the author of the 2009 book, Trading Regime Analysis, and contributor to the Socionomic Studies of Society and Culture. He is currently the editor of the service Global Rates and Money Flows and the European Short-Term Update, as well as contributes monthly to the Global Market Perspective publication. Not to mention he's just a great all-around guy. Murray, welcome to the show. Thanks, Greg. It's uh, really happy to be here. It's uh, looking, looking forward to a, ch- a, ch- a good chat. We have a wide variety of topics we can dive into as you're a renaissance man in the financial world. So we'll see where the conversation takes us. Um, let's get into it. From a macro perspective, what are the three most important things you think people should be aware of now and why? Well, I think uh, probably the biggest element that people should be aware of is the fact that um, for a decades-long trend has changed, and that's um, that's in interest rates, which, of course, Elliott Wave International identified the turning point back in, in 2020, uh, and, and before that, we were obviously warning subscribers that it was going to turn. And the, the, the huge move up we've seen in interest rates and and uh, bond yields is um, a lot of people think that uh, it's come as quite a shock to people when they think, oh, well, this it must be over now. But obviously, our analysis suggests that it's just only starting. So, um, you know, I think that's, uh, that's the, the, the one thing to be aware of. And, and kind of allied to that, the second one would be uh, how that is going to affect the uh, amount of debt that there's in there is in the world, and um, you know, so identifying countries where you know private debt is a, a, an issue, uh, and certainly the public debt, um, you know, in the US, obviously it's um, it's ballooning uh, almost out of control, and you know, the US is is uh, safeguarded by the, by the fact that it's got there is the reserve currency of the world at the moment. But if that starts to be questioned, that could be a really big thing for. Uh, the U.S. economy and, and the global economy, and I think the third macro, you know, thirty thousand foot uh, picture to be aware of uh, is the fact that uh, society is really changing um, from globalization. I mean, we have had a period of decades of uh, more and more integration, more and more globalization, and now things are changing. The relationship between China and America has broken down and of course we've got uh, some you know bad actors around the world like Russia who are creating um, aspects in, in Europe at the moment so um, that's going to have a knock-on effect on all sorts of things uh, you know we've seen the, the effect already on commodity prices uh, but it'll, it'll, it'll sub, subdivide into a whole lot of things uh, in financial and commodity markets. You talked about the the longer term picture of rates, and and you know, and it's it's a it's a secular bull market. The thing that that bothers me on a on a regular basis is that even people that even people that I read whom I respect who are looking for longer for for, for higher rates over the long term are looking for rates to go lower over the course of the next two months four months, six months, eight months, whatever, just like the Fed is praying that rates will come, that, that, that inflation will taper sufficiently so you know, to get near their, their 2% target. So, you know, I look at the, um, that, so I look at like the 30-year yield in the U.S., and we've come down to previous fourth already. It's possible that the low is in and that, you know, you know, granted, you know, we might be there might be a B wave rally and there might be another C wave decline. But frankly, that's not the way the JGBs look. And the only market that I think to me looks 
like it really is in need of a C wave down. In other words, lower rates near term is the is the bullet. Right. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I, I think uh, certainly with regard to the GGBs, there's there's there's, there's you know no, no doubt from an Elliott wave perspective that, that that's still in um, an impulsive uh, move higher in uh, in yields. Um, and of course, the Bank of Japan were you know so late in coming to the the party. Um, but they're finally they're finally getting here, uh, being dragged uh, to into increasing rates as all central banks, as we know, always are by the markets. Um, but yeah, I think the, the beauty of early wave analysis is that it gives us that um, anticipation, that uh, ability to forecast based on the structure of the, in this case, the rally in yields that we've seen uh, over the last uh, few months or the, the advance in yields. And I think that um, yeah, it's certainly from the perspective I'm looking at would suggest that we get another a, a, a move down. That's interesting. You know, I was looking at the the chart of the the CRB index the other day, and it's a very similar uh, setup there as well. So um, it looks like it, the, the the decline in yields, if we get them over the next few months, um, you know, might be accompanied by um, a decline in in some commodity markets or commodity prices as well, which you know. Um, you know, as we know, you know, sea waves they, they kind of you know sometimes fool people into into thinking that uh, there's a new trend, and uh, I'm sure yeah, the, the the Fed will be uh, relieved, uh, central banks will be relieved. Um, but this idea that the uh, the central banks control infl- inflation is uh, for the birds, you know, really. And uh, we showed the chart the other day of. Um, uh, certainly from the UK perspective, you know, our prime minister over here has been uh, been waxing lyrical about the fact that, that he can control inflation. And of course, we we, we always chuckle at uh, LA Wave, of course, when, when politicians start to make claims about what they can and can't control or they can control. Um, but the, the, yeah, the, the, the correlation between um, commodities and uh, you know, certainly UK uh, consumer price inflation is very very high, you know, almost almost, you know, really significant, and um, so it's 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 certainly yeah nothing to do with the politicians in terms of inflation. For sure, I I thought of you yesterday. Whitmer showing a chart this month of uh, uh, disposable income, which is like a multi-decade low, and taxes in the UK, which when adjusted for uh, GDP it was adjusted for GDP are at a multi-decade high, higher even than they were in the 1960s when the tax rate was was like 95 percent. Yep, the marginal tax rate was uh, was very high. In fact, it caused uh, Sean Connery to uh, to uh, emigrate from the from the country. I uh, went to live in uh, the Bahamas, I think it was, uh, which was a big thing at the time. Uh, because his, his, his marginal tax rate was something like 90 uh, percent. So. Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of people left the country uh, at that stage, but absolutely correct. You know, it's kind of gone under the radar uh, a little bit over here um, because there hasn't been you know big increases in, uh, in in income tax, but there's all sorts of other taxes that have come in um, uh, and, and reduction of subsidies, etc. So it means that the, the tax burden ha- is the highest in uh, a generation, uh, and that's come under uh, uh, a government who are on the the right side of the or the political right of the of the um spectrum who would you know normally be uh, advocating for lower taxes do you guys think anything will actually change with the elections next month or in five weeks with your elections you guys are so so the uk does elections right right I mean, you just, you know, it's like, hey, let's have an election and hey, we're going to have it in six weeks and then it's done. I mean, we have, we have a perpetual election here in the United States. It gets really old. It's really, really old. Yes, yes. Uh, well, they, they, they tried to change uh, over here. They went to a fixed term parliament. Uh, traditionally, it's never been fixed term and the, the prime minister could call an election whenever they wanted to. But for the fixed term, it meant that uh, we had to have an election by the end of this year. Um, so it was just a question of when it, when it was going to be called. So yes, it's uh, we're in full election nearing campaign uh, over here, or 
you know, the politicians are, obviously. Um, so, yeah, uh, in terms of is it going to affect anything? Um, no. Uh, you know, we, we know that the markets dance to their own tune, uh, their own their own Elliott waves. Um, you know, the uh, I was looking at, to see the data the other day. Um, we've got, we're lucky enough to have uh, a, a, a big data set of uh, the uh, UK stock market to see whether there's any sort of relationship as there is in the US data, as was shown by the, the Socionomics Institute um, a number of years ago in regards to, you know, elections and, and what it means for the incumbents as to whether the stock market is up or down. Um and the, you know there wasn't a great deal of um, uh, evidence to suggest either way uh, in, in that regard. But certainly, it's if you're looking at social mood right now in uh, the in the UK, the the broad index is still down from its peak uh, of a couple of years ago. But the the, the benchmark for its hundred is is up. So you know you could say. You could try and rationalise that by saying that, well, the, the FTSE 100 is a very international index and it's, full, it's filled with you know, uh, commodity stocks. So maybe that's, you know, got a little bit of a nuance to it. But it would certainly, you know, we, we showed the chart the other day that um, uh, of the broad index and how it's declined and how that over the last couple of years has uh coincided with the kind of um, implosion of the ruling uh, uh, Conservative Party uh, over here. So right. that, that that explains what's happening now. Well, well, to answer your question, Dave, will anything change? Uh, tax policy, you know, we, we can we can talk about um, whether governments, you know, over the peace uh, and their tax policies change things. Um, again, we looked at, um, you know, the the... the, the correlation between uh, government budget deficits and uh, interest rates. And there really isn't, a, over time, there's not really um, a, a big relationship. But certainly the Labour Party over here who have, who have um, are expected to, to, to come in, um, they, they've said that they're not going to change much uh, on tax policy in the, in the foreseeable future. So, uh, Murray, one of the things I like best about reading your stuff, and I, I read your stuff, is is that you come up with what I think at least are, are interesting um, studies. Uh, a lot of morale, you're like a relative strength junkie. I mean that in a good way, right? But I mean, you know, you, cause you're, you're, you know, continually thinking of what if I compare this to this and how does that look and what does it mean? And more often than not, there's some interesting correlation there. There's like, I haven't seen that anywhere else before. And I look at a lot of stuff. So for me not to have seen it someplace else before is, is pretty, honestly, is, is pretty cool. Um, and uh, and I, in fact, that was one of the first things that um, when you when you spoke at the uh, socionomics conference like a decade or, ago or, or something like that, and that was your presentation there where you were looking at relative strength. I think it was it was among sectors. So you'd like look at durable goods versus non-durable goods. And then be able to draw a socionomic conclusion as a result, or uh, alcoholic beverages versus non-alcoholic beverages, and that kind of thing. So, well, anyhow, and I forget if I had a question related to that, but I have a question related to this. So, in terms of commodities, because you mentioned commodities a couple of times, and you've got much more classical training economically than I have, right? So, so, and you know, we're. We're looking for a deflationary time at some point. And at the same time, we've left the door open for hyperinflation. And now, as I understand, the classical definition of deflation is it's actually is the, is the credit is deflating, right? As opposed to the when people talk about deflation or inflation, what we usually think about is prices. So I'm wondering... Is it possible, and I, and I think about like the real estate market or just food prices specifically, is it possible to have, can hyperinflation and deflation, the traditional actual definition of deflation, coexist? Or is that just anathema? We're not anathema, but impossible. Well, I guess the, the, the closest uh, analogy would come to for that would be 
this idea of stagflation, where you have that a stagnant economy, which is not growing, which would, you know, from historical perspectives, often be accompanied by um, declines in, in in credit and and, and money, um, as you as you say, are the, the definitions of um, inflation from an economics point of view, and um, they could they, they have been in the past. Think of the nineteen seventies, accompanied by uh, increases in uh, consumer prices and, and producer prices, commodity prices, etc. So it, it, it's not uh, it's not unheard of to have that idea of credit contracting, credit a uh, contracting economy with um, higher you know consumer prices uh, as well. Because I mean, you know, that's what hurts the most. I mean, you know, you look at, uh, I mean, you look at housing prices, which have been uh, away from, well away from the mean for a few years now, yeah, and you know, and, you, and and we've all seen we've all seen the charts where it's like you know okay, it's we're we're where we were in two thousand six to two thousand six two thousand seven, and prices are going to revert to the mean, and that what that but what that means is that you know uh, nominal house prices would drop by forty percent or more, and People who just bought are going to get hurt. People who haven't bought are going to look forward to it. At the same time, and I always thought, you know, reversion to the mean didn't do anything for the dinosaurs, you know, with the ice age and stuff. And um, because they didn't live long enough to benefit from it. And Mm -hmm. and, uh, I just, and I, and around here, just so my very local area, at least, they're still putting houses up like it's gone out of style. Uh, I mean, there are, you know, they just they just threw up. In fact, you've got shrinkflation. They just threw up three houses or are throwing up three houses on the corner a mile down the road. Each one is, I'm guessing, 800 square feet. And I know that they're going to charge at least $200 a square foot if they put those houses on the market. And mm-hmm. and for me, at least $200 a square foot. I mean, that was that that's like where the rich people lived. <laughs> Yes, well, it's, it's kind of the same over here. I mean, the housing market has, um, uh, residential housing market has cooled off a little bit, but it's it's st- it's still been you know crazy over the last number of years, and um, and I think that speaks to you know like you were saying, Dave, about the credit creation. Um, you know, credit credit's fine. You know, debt debt's okay as long as it's productive. Um, it's when it doesn't like it, when it's excess credit, excess debt, and it's unproductive. And that's when it spills over into things like, um, you know, residential housing, and we call it buy to let over here. When people would buy, you know, a few more homes and let them out, um, and it's just it's just excess credit, and and, and it's a, it's another example of um, or a manifestation of the, the the debt bubble that we've been in since uh, well, basically since uh, we you know the currencies came off of the gold. Uh, the Bretton Woods uh, back in the nineteen uh, in the nineteen seventies, and Nixon uh, closed the the gold window uh, famously. Um, but you know, it, it's it, it's really interesting with regards to the uh, debate about um, inflation and deflation, and, and you know, ninety nine percent of the people in the financial markets will use those terms in relation to consumer prices, um, and. Uh, the central banks over the over the decades have kind of fooled us into thinking, because they have a, an agenda of you know money printing that they want to continue. Uh, they've fooled us into thinking that deflation is bad, um, i.e., i.e., falling prices, um, falling consumer prices. Um, but actually, if you think about it, it, it's 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 a natural event. Falling prices should be a natural event of a growing economy, and I think it was back in the period of. Um, uh, there's been a number of examples over over the over the years, but certainly uh, the famous example is the the late 1800s uh, growth period in the U.S. when there was tremendous growth in the U.S. Uh, economy, and yet consumer prices were declining. Um, and this is a natural thing because if you if you think about it, you've got a growing economy. The economy should be becoming more productive, um, uh, and productivity should be should be uh, moving moving up. 
Uh, and that in itself will have a suppression effect on on prices. And think of like you know computers over the last thirty years. Um, you know, perhaps you know once uh, things are this, this, the dust is settled on this correction or more certainly that we're we're thinking about. Um, uh, obviously, the buzzword at the moment is is AI, and um, and people are looking forward to the productivity gains that are going to be. Amazing over the next few decades for AI. So perhaps they will, um, and perhaps that will be, you know, enable us to get out of this um, lie that the central banks have been telling us about that a growing economy uh, uh, shouldn't have falling prices. Is unemployment low over there like it is here in the States? I mean, it's, it's, it's like sitting at 3% locked in there and has been forever, in spite of the fact that you, you, that, you, you kind of look at what's going on and you go, is that a good number or not? You know? Yeah, I mean, it looked at, um, you know, employment in the, in the Western uh, world, at least uh, in Europe, uh, so Eurozone um, and UK uh, and US, all in terms of unemployment rate, all at or hovering around uh, historic lows. And, um, you know, you're talking about you know, mean reversion uh, just a, a wee while ago. And if anything is mean reverting, it, 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 it's, it's that aspect of the the economy. So, you know, we know we go through booms and busts. We know there's a there's a, there's a economic cycle. And so, you know, if, if the chart of unemployment um, was a stock and you were looking at it, um, you know, would you buy or sell something that which is at historic lows and always mean revert and always mean reverse? So, um and it's certainly the employment is going to be the, the the key, you know, to you know as 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 it always has been. I mean, the U.S. U.S. I'm, we're watching obviously uh, U.S. employment really closely because that's that's actually the key to the the entire global economy. I mean, the U.S. the U.S. economy is the biggest, most important, uh, most dynamic uh, in the world, and um, the huge part of the U.S. economy. Is, is is mostly services based and consumer based. So it's the U.S. consumer, um, which is the most important for the U.S. Uh, economy. And obviously, if uh, you know if you've got a job, you're you're confident. Uh, once your job or prospects start to to be shaken a little bit, you stop spending. And um, you know, once the U.S. consumer stops spending, um, the rest of the world will take a take a bath as well. I know Greg and I were talking about U.S. consumer earlier. I'm going to step on your stuff. Is that okay? Yeah. So, <laughs> so and you know, because I know one of the charts that you showed in this month's in in this month's issue is the chart of um, of the U.S. consumer getting in, in trouble uh, delinquencies on their credit card bill. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and uh, and I know and I know I know it it, re, it resonated with Greg because you were focusing on the 18 to 39 year old, you know, age bracket. Or an age bracket about which I no longer care. So, <laughs> Me neither. And and and, and there's yeah right. and there's no you know um, not publicly anyhow. Um, and and that's a pretty steep slope that that uh, you know discrepant that the uh, delinquencies are getting up there. And, yeah, not just delinquencies. Like it's like ninety plus days delinquent, right? Is that is that that chart that you showed Murray in the global rates and money flows is. Just, it's so interesting to see uh, that, and and I I believe it to be true. Obviously, uh, I, I know I have a lot of friends who um, are just overextended upon overextended, uh, buying cars, houses, uh, TVs, going on expensive vacations with money I know that they don't have. Um, mm -hmm. So it is it's incredibly interesting, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, like. What are the implications of this? Like, what, when when is the domino going to fall for them? If if it is going to fall, like, how's what's what's the situation that we're in? Well, it gets back to you know what we said earlier about this idea of of, of excess debt, and um, and also we said at the very beginning about the fact that uh, this big increase in interest rates has come as a as a shock. I mean, you know, obviously uh, for us at uh, Elliott Wave International, with a lot of uh, experience. Uh, you know, around the around the company, I've seen the cycles before. You know, um, when interest rates were at zero and or negative, you know, 
you really would have to have been very ignorant not to think that this situation cannot last. And um, and obviously, it, you know, it hasn't. But, you know, it looks like uh, there's a, there was a lot of people out there, maybe the younger generation, who, who, who thought, well, you know, interest rates are, are naturally going to be between, you know, zero and 2% forever. Uh, I might as well just leverage myself up and, and, and spend, spend, spend. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's maybe a factor of what's happened it, 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 this time round. Um, and, you know, when does the, the penny drop? Well, I think, uh, yeah, there, 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 there'll probably be, you know, a little bit of a, a, an easing if we think, if we're, if we're right and bond yields come down over the next uh, few months, there'll probably be a, a little bit of uh, relief, you know, in that regard. But the next wave higher in interest rates that we're expecting, that, that will probably be the time that uh, things really get very uh, bad and um, cause a lot of people to, uh, you know, readjust uh, significantly. You alluded to that at the at the top of the at the top of the program uh, where you talked about you know corporations uh, having debt and the idea that you know with rates going higher they they've got debt they're going to have to roll over so it's money that they may have they may have financed at one percent or two percent or or even even ridiculously less than that and you know so you know uh, on however many millions or tens of millions and. If they've got to refinance that at five percent or six percent or higher, that's going to take a chunk. That's going to you know could, could to, that's going to eat into their profits. Let's at at the very least. What do you think happens? I mean, do do you just see a lot of consolidation? That's what I love about the um, with, uh, the speaking of the relative strength stuff. When you, you you look at you know at performance of a stock within a sector, and you look at the sector against the broad market, and you know for the you know, the, the studies that you've published on banks, you know, just your little vertical histogram where uh, you know, you've got the ones that are at, at most risk versus the ones that are at least risk, I, I find very helpful or or unnerving, depending on it's like, oh, crap, that's my bank. <laughs> well, yes, it's, um, you know, that that's certainly the, from a relative strength point of view. Um, and of course, you know, it's a, I always, always, I've always found it difficult to talk about relative strength with regard to, um, you know, the charts that, that that I show because it can be confusing for someone who knows something about technical analysis is maybe reading the the piece or, or listening to it. It's not the relative strength index, which is a which is a completely separate thing. It, it's like right. like you say, Dave, it's one stock against another, and and you can get some really good um, clues as to you know what sentiment is is like, and and bad news doesn't. Come out of the blue, you, you know, a, a, a stock that will give bad news uh, will nine times out of ten have been uh, underperforming its peers, uh, you know, and, and it, it, before that happens. And you had a couple of great, you had Credit Suisse you had ahead of time, and and Deutsche Bank. You'd shown both of those before either of them got into any trouble. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think the classic, the classic was Enron. I mean, I wasn't I know, with Elliott Wave International at the time, but I, I distinctly remember. The stock was 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 falling, was de- declining, um, underperforming uh, its peers, underperforming the sector, and yet, you know, I did this at a presentation once. I, I looked at uh, during that period of months, uh, every single stock analyst or conventional stock analyst had it as a as a as a buy, uh, all the way down. You know, so um, you've got to, we we know that the markets uh, you basically. Um, you know, tell tell the truth in terms of trends. That doesn't mean that there are, that we can't take advantage of turning points and sentiment. But basically, you know, it pays to it pays to listen to the market. But um, I'm getting back to what you were talking about the uh, on the credit markets there, uh, Dave. Uh, and then maybe it's a bit related to what Greg was saying about his uh, his peers as well. There's there's a there's a great buzz phrase in the markets at the moment, um, which people are talking about. Uh, it's called survive until 25. Uh, and so, you know, what they're saying is that companies who need to roll over uh, debt, um, huge amounts of debt, um, starting this year, starting this year, and the, the big wall of maturity is maybe next year and, and, and the year after. Um, but if they can survive what's happening now until, you know, next year, um, 
interest rates will be lower. You know, they're able to finance. Uh, you know, they refinance um, uh, at a better, at a, at a, at a easier, easier pace, an easier way. Um, and of course, that speaks to the sentiment that people are really expecting interest rates to be lower uh, and not higher over the long, over the longer term. So, so yes, the, the charts at the moment are saying maybe a little bit of a decline in, in bond yields uh, over the next few months, but but up again afterwards. So, um, it won't be. I don't think uh, when this wall of maturity starts to get rolled over next year, um, it's not going to be a, a pleasant experience for most companies. Um, that whole survive till 25 tied in with, you know, I mean, I just, you know, the, the idea, the idea that even people looking for higher rates long term are looking for lower rates first, as is everybody else. And if I'm the market, right? And I've got my boot on your neck, okay. In terms of in terms of rates, why would I pick it up? Why, you know? And, mm. Now maybe that's the other nice sentiment you have, but uh, but I've been in I've been in that bad position before, so you know, mm. market wise. Um, yeah. Well, there's cer- there's certainly some evidence suggesting that uh, you know, although yeah, bond yields. Um, like the U.S. Treasury bond yields uh, might come down. There's certainly over the next few months. There's certainly some evidence to suggest that that might not be the situation for uh, corporate bond markets. Uh, if you look at the the junkiest end of the junk bond market, the the triple C and lower rated bonds, they've been subtly underperforming uh, the next notch up. Um, in terms of credit rating. And uh, that is a sign that, you know, people are beginning to get quite nervous about uh, credit risk uh, in the market. And of course, it ties in with the, our Elliott Wave uh, analysis on stock markets, which is suggesting that there's going to be um, uh, an imminent uh, peak uh, there. So, yes, I think um, in terms of uh, credit markets, there's, there's uh, evidence suggesting that 2025 is not going to be pleasant. Well, on that, I mean, I guess we could probably wrap up for today, Murray. Uh, we would love to have you back, obviously, to dive more into everything that you talk about on a regular basis. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what are some ways that one could protect themselves during this time or, uh, you know, get themselves all situated? And, and you know, if, if it is tough times ahead, uh, do you have any advice to give to people out there? Well, you know, as, as, as Bob wrote in Conquer the Crash, uh, there are various ways that you can hedge against difficult times in the market. The most obvious one being in cash, you know, high high quality cash, you know, treasury bills, um, having, you know, some sort of uh, relationship, having some sort of exposure to Precious metals as well. You know, gold at the moment is is looking, as Steve and uh, and the other uh, analysts at uh, Elliott Wave International have been uh, calling for a long time that gold's going to be moving higher, um, and it's now it's now happening. Silver's obviously following suit. So another sign of ge- maybe geopolitical nervousness you know, coming in. Um, but I think once the uh, once this Slight reduction in, in 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 interest rates that we're anticipating certainly at this juncture, you know, takes place. Once once we start getting into that, the next move up in rates, uh, a good uh, product that that, that uh, people should maybe check out is uh, floating rate notes, uh, which uh, go go with interest rates. So they're protected and they will give you um, as long as the high quality FRNs, you can get corporate FRNs. Um, but if you go for the higher quality FRNs, triple A's, uh, they, they should be okay. Um, also, always always check what your what the stock is doing against the against the index, of course. Um, but um, high quality floating rate notes will pay you will pay you more money as interest rates go up, uh, and so that's uh, that's a good hedge. Yeah, Bob's a huge advocate for FRNs. I mean, he's he was early, and he was early on them too, which is which is which is nice. Um, there's, so there's corporate FRNs. Yes, yes, in the office. Yep. Um, 
There's an FRN, yeah, ETF, which yeah, well, yeah. might be worth checking out. Yeah. Are the couple of points more than just the than the government backed? On uh, on the you know, in terms of yield on the corporates? Well Are yeah. The corporates yield more than the government? It, it, it's just like uh like any yield spread would be, you know, the, the lower the lower you go down in quality in, in terms of credit rating, the higher the, the premium that they'll pay above the above the US Treasury rate. Do people still buy corporate bonds? I mean, is there is there much of a market for that? I mean, you know, like like for a guy to actually go out and buy, I don't know if Nvidia has like uh, you know the five percent to twenty forty five, right? Maybe twenty twenty forty four, but right? Yes, I mean, um, it, it, it's interesting because back in back in the late eighteen hundreds, um, early nineteen hundreds in in the stock market, uh, both here and you know Wall Street. Particularly, uh, bonds bonds were the thing to buy. People, you know, they wouldn't buy uh, common stocks. It would it would be bonds, uh, corporate bonds, and um, you know that that's that's because you get obviously getting an income, uh, you know, from that. Um, you know, you get an income of dividend from a common stock, but it's you know they can decide whether or not they're not going to pay a dividend. Um, so that's what that's what you know people liked back back then, and obviously the, the part of the the equity culture that we've talked about for decades in in Ellie Wave International has meant that that bonds, corporate bonds have kind of taken a back seat um, to to common stock. Um, but that now with the increase in rates uh, that has been and we're anticipating to continue um, over the next number of years, then I think uh, you know people will look at some corporates and they'll think well. A corporate bond, and they'll say, "Crikey, I could get you know, I could get an eight percent return there, uh, and that is a good company, and it, it doesn't look like it's going to have any trouble. Um, so you know, why not? Why not do that? So I think from, I mean, obviously, institutional investors, um, you know, when I was working in institutions over over the over the decades, uh, huge that's they they they're huge users and buyers uh, of corporate bonds, investors in corporate bonds. Uh, the, the 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 individual investor, uh, not so much these days. But I think that's going to be that's going to be changing over the next few years as people realise that uh, rates are going to stay high. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I mean, because that uh, that's one of the reasons that we you know that uh, we you launched the, the the global rates product is because the whole you know bonds are back, baby, right? Kind of thing that. Uh, mm. Somebody on the street actually ran that. Was I don't know if it was J.P. Morgan or or or, or somebody else stole our idea. Um, but I, I mean, and you're you, look, you, you are both big, you know, big historical uh, picture things. So you know, could we get back to that late 1800s, early 1900s? I mean, that, in terms of in terms of bonds actually being the go-to game in town and stocks being for. You know, gamblers and ne'er do wells. I think it's it's very possible. I mean, one one of the interesting trends over the last number of years has been the decline in public companies. You know, people companies have been taking going from public to private, and um, so the the help you know been helped by the the boom in, in in private equity and private credit you know funds. But I mean, um, so yeah, I think. Uh, Publicly traded common stock, and especially if we're correct, and and the stock market is going to go into a slump, um, they will become persona non grata, I think, uh, and corporate bonds will will take over, uh, will, will be able to fill that gap. Cool, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting. Well, uh, if you want to get ongoing on depth analysis with charts and forecasts from Murray Gunn, go to elliotwave.com. Or click the links in this video's description. And if you want to dip your toes in our world to learn more, we recommend you check out our club EWI for just $2 a month. You can get access to exclusive events, books, reports, videos, and more. Go to lawave.com slash club. Once again, thank you guys. It's It's been fun. I've learned a lot. I know that's why I've been quiet. I've just been listening to you guys. So it's been great for me. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate you taking the time. No, it's been it's been wonderful. Really enjoyed it. So thanks, guys.